Hello wonderful viewer, this is Anton and welcome to What The Math. Have you ever wondered what would happen if we were to squeeze all of the human beings into one big chunk and then launch it in orbit around Earth? Today you're going to find out. Welcome, enjoy the video. <laughs> Now actually it's not going to be as simple as I just mentioned. We are going to do a little bit of science and talk a little bit about the idea of biomass and also carbon cycle. Now carbon cycle refers to the idea of carbon in our planet which you can kind of see right here under organics um, being recycled and redistributed from the atmosphere down to a lithosphere which is basically the rocks uh, into the ocean and into the biosphere which is basically life like us and other things like animals and bacteria and plants and so on and essentially then returning back into atmosphere and also lithosphere. So this is a cycle that's kind of responsible for maintaining the life on our planet, maintaining the balance and uh, things like temperature as well. So the infamous global warming is of course the result of humans disturbing the cycle a little bit and causing a little bit more um, carbon dioxide which is right here um, being released into the atmosphere a little bit more than there should be because usually that carbon dioxide is stored in what we call carbon sinks which are either plants or even things like of course rocks. Now we're not going to talk about uh, greenhouse effect or global warming in this particular video. Maybe this will be some other video in the future. What we are going to talk about is the experiment where we're going to think about what would happen if you basically combine all of the carbon into one big chunk and then place it into orbit around our planet. Now let's start with a simple question of biomass. So biomass is total mass of something some kind of an organism or I guess all of the organisms um, from our planet uh, all put together in what we usually call um, dry carbon atoms or I guess you can also call it dry biomass. Basically if you were to put all of the carbon from all of us into one big chunk this would be called dry biomass. Now of course we are not just carbon, we have things like water in our bodies, we have other elements and this is why there's also something called wet or fresh biomass. Now let's imagine for a second, uh, we combine all of the humans, I take all of the human beings and squeeze them all into one big rock. How big do you think this rock would be? Take your guess because you're about to find out. Now if I were to take one human being and uh, condense this human being into one rock, this is what I would get. I'm calling this rock a human and it's actually kind of shiny because of, I guess, some of the materials being evaporated here. And this rock is about 65 kilograms, it's about 25 centimeters in radius and it's basically kind of spherical in shape. Now this is one human being, has about 70%, uh, 72% water and the rest are organics. So how many human beings do we have on Earth? Well, it's about 7% or I guess 7.4 billion people. So if we were to take this number and multiply it by 7.4 billion, this is what you would get. And here is the total capacity or total mass of human beings. It's a rock that is growing and is around 486 meters in radius in total. So actually not very big at all if you think about it, but basically if you were to combine uh, the biomass of all of the human beings on Earth right now, this is what you would get. And not a very large rock, I guess, but not a very small rock either. Here is actually uh, a third stage from Apollo 12 as a comparison. We're going to place this in orbit if we can, or possibly not because it's actually too small to maintain the orbit here. Uh, but anyway, so let's launch the third stage and I'm going to show you what it looks like in comparison to this rock. And so here is the third stage of Apollo 12 and as it escapes this rock you can kind of see how big it is or I guess how small it is. It's not particularly big. I think I expected something a lot larger the first time I did this. But basically this is all of the humans. Now now in total this is approximately 350 to about 480 uh, million tons of stuff. So this is what humans look like but we are of course not the biggest biomass. As a matter of fact I'm going to place another biomass right next to it and this time it's going to be our cattle and specifically here we're talking about both cows and also sheep and goats all together. Basically animals that we raise and use for food and for other things. 
And the size of the cattle rock is a little bit bigger. It's about 530 uh, meters in radius. So there is the human rock. It's a little bit farther away. Uh, and this is just about, I think, 100 or not even 100, about 60 meters more in radius. So in terms of size, they're very similar. And cattle and uh, sheep and goats um, are a little bit larger in terms of biomass. And right between them, I'm going to place the next uh, type of animal, and here we have ants and termites. Now, I decided to combine these because even though they're different ant types of animals, uh, they are creepy crawlies and they tend to live in colonies, so why not? And here, they're actually double uh, the biomass of humans, and the rock here is about 783 uh, meters in radius, so it's a little bit bigger than cattle as well. Now, interestingly, one of the most successful animals in terms of biomass, and here it's actually a very funny green shape as well, uh, is something called Antarctic krill. This is, uh, or these are really, really tiny animals, very similar to plankton, uh, which are usually also the most favorite food of the whales. And altogether, they are about 379 million ton together, and this is more than the humans and also more than the cattle. Uh, but the thing is, or I guess that's the ironic thing, uh, the animal that eats them the most, which is, of course, whales, or here we're talking about things like blue whales, um, are very, very tiny in comparison. Their biomass is only about 0.5 million tons, um, even though it used to be about 36 a long time ago, but because of the whaling uh, back in the 19th and 20th century, most of the whales have actually been exterminated, so... Antarctic krill got a chance to procreate and increase their biomass because whales are just not eating enough of them. And the size of this green blobby looking rock is about 625 meters in radius. Now there is another type of animal that, that is even larger in terms of biomass and the, this is of course uh, things like fish. And altogether fish actually make up uh, up to about 2 billion tons um, of biomass which would make a rock uh, that's about one kilometer in radius, so much larger than the previous rocks. If we were to put all the fish together, this is what you would get. Now, there are actually quite a lot of other animal species, and some of them actually do have a large biomass, like, for example, cyanobacteria, um, also known as picoplankton, uh, does have a biomass of about a billion tons as well. But something else actually makes up a huge, huge amount of organic biomass on, on our planet and that something is bacteria specific prokaryotic cells and so these are things that live everywhere including your uh, your guts you have lots of prokaryotes inside your belly inside your gut uh, and they also can be found in, in pretty much every single situation on earth they're underground they're in super hot conditions uh, near volcanoes, they're also in super cold conditions in lakes and in Antarctica. So they're basically very, very ubiquitous. They are absolutely everywhere. And if I were to combine all of them together, this is what you would get. A rock a size of about 6.8 kilometers in radius. Now that is a huge amount of stuff. Much, 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 much bigger than anything else I've just showed you. Now, here's a Halley's Comet in comparison. It's basically the size of Halley's Comet. It's also about the size of the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So essentially, most of the biomass is the bacteria. Now, let's find out what would happen if you actually combine all of this together. And let's basically get all of the life in one big chunk. And so, all together, this so-called living biomass is a rock uh, that's about... 1,000 gigatons or um, 8.2 kilometers in radius. So basically a very large asteroid is uh, all of the life on Earth. If you were to combine everything, mix it up in, in a mixer, put it all together, this is what you would get. But in terms of the actual carbon, this is not everything actually. There's a lot more, more carbon, there's a lot more stuff on Earth uh, where carbon can be stored. So even though this is actually what uh, life represents, um, and about double of that would, rep would be represented by um, dead biomass, basically dead animals, there's a lot more things going on on our beautiful planet, and let's actually put them in here as well. And let's start with fossil fuels. So this is obviously things like coal, oil, gas, and also things like peat as well, uh, all of which can produce energy for us. And so if we were to combine all of them into one big chunk, we would get a rock about 13.1 kilometers in radius, much larger than the biomass. And here it's about um, 4.1 gigatons of stuff. 
Now, a lot of the carbon is also dissolved in, um, in all of this blue stuff, the water. It's actually part of the oceans as well. Oceans dissolve a lot of carbon. They actually keep a lot of it and they are technically a carbon sink. If I were to take out all of the carbon from the oceans, this is what you would get. An even larger rock of about 27.2 kilometers in radius. So this is about 38,000 gigatons. And um, so what this suggests is that basically we have to take care of the oceans. If we don't take care of our oceans, if we actually make them warm up, a lot of the carbon from the oceans is going to come out into the atmosphere. Now, why is this important? Well, because our atmosphere only has this much. This is our atmospheric carbon compared to our ocean carbon. It's about 7.42 kilometers in radius. This is about three times bigger. Now, important because if suddenly all of this stuff comes to the atmosphere, this is when global warming is going to start occurring. And that's not it. A lot of the carbon is actually hidden in our earth and in our crust. Inside earth crust, there's a huge amount of carbon. If suddenly something happens and there's like volcanic eruptions and the carbon from uh, from the ground from Earth starts leaking into the atmosphere as well. This is how much of it can actually come out. So inside our, of our lithosphere, inside of, our, uh, of Earth and inside of our ground, you can actually find as much as this. So there you go. This much. This is a huge amount of stuff. As a matter of fact, this is a 331 kilometer in radius that just ate all of my other carbons. This right here is where most of the carbon is. It's inside of, it's essentially inside Earth, inside the ground. Now, it will usually only come out when there is an eruption, when there is some kind of a um, ground shaking event, like for example, an earthquake may release some carbon, um, or if suddenly there is a huge collision with our planet where a meteorite or a comet collides and basically releases a huge amount of carbon, that's when it would start coming out. But for the most part, this will always stay in the ground and this is the main sink for this carbon. We don't really want to have too much carbon in our atmosphere, we don't want to have too much carbon in our water, but we do want to have most of it in our ground, which is why Taking care of both uh, soil and also water is kind of important for us to essentially prevent all of this stuff from coming out into our into basically our atmosphere and then warming up our planet. Because if all of this is suddenly in the atmosphere, the entire planet is going to get really, really warm. And I think in the next video, we're going to take a look at how warm it may, might actually get. Now, all together, this is essentially a good representation of how much carbon there is in our planet. And essentially, it's a relatively large chunk. If you look at it from the outside, it's actually pretty big. But of course, most of it is inside of the ground. Uh, some of it is in the atmosphere. Some of it is represented as obviously us, as biosphere. But most of it is either in the oceans or uh, fossil fuels or, of course, in, um, in the ground. And I guess what is really interesting to see is how tiny the animals are in comparison to the total amount of carbon that you can actually see being absorbed right now. Uh, anyway, so this was ants and termites and they're being swallowed by the total ground carbon here. Uh, but uh, yeah, basically it's a very, very large chunk. If you remember, um, human beings only were about, what, 400 something meters in radius? This is about 331 kilometers. And before we finish this video, let's actually take this chunk of carbon and send it somewhere else. Let's actually pick something to send it to. I guess we can send it to the moon, but the moon is actually not present in this particular simulation. We could uh, obviously send it to another planet. Let's send it to Mars. And I guess what we're going to do is launch this carbon bowl, uh, we're going to call it Earth Carbon, into Mars and then see what happens. Basically, here it comes going to approach Mars relatively slowly and you can kind of see that the size of that thing is really 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 big and uh, we're going to smack down into or onto the surface of Mars and possibly add a little bit of carbon to its surface as well. Now we're pretty sure that there is carbon on Mars we just don't really know how much there is but it's about to have a lot more and boom boom and here we go. So now Mars has a lot more carbon and still no life well maybe some other time anyway so hopefully you'll learn a little bit about biomass and oh my god what's happening here and about carbon cycle um from this video hopefully you learned what it is how it's 
affecting our planet and why it's actually important to try to keep balance in terms of carbon distribution from uh, both water and atmosphere and also of course ground as well. I just realized I actually added a huge amount of water to, to Mars. That's, that's what we actually see on the surface here. And uh, there's obviously carbon here as well now. So it looks like I didn't just bring carbon, but I also brought a very, very large amount of water to Mars. Now, all in all, I think it's a pretty fascinating topic, and I think in the next video, or one of the next videos, we're going to take a look at how this may actually affect planet Earth if we were to suddenly release all of this carbon into the atmosphere, and how the temperature might actually change. But for now, I think this is it. Thank you for watching, guys. I appreciate all of your support. Subscribe if you still haven't. Like this video if you've enjoyed watching it, and I'll see you in the next video. Game you later, and as always, bye-bye. Now, let's see what happens if we warm up Mars and if we possibly change some of its parameters to make it more habitable. Oh, look at that liquid water. Beautiful. Now, give us life. Life I want.